Okay. All right. So um, uh, last time in class, we talked about uh, scalar multiplication and the dot product. Uh, today, we're going to actually start with the cross product. And then we're going to get into um, three different types of vector operations. We're going to talk about gradient, uh, divergence, and then if we, can get, if we have time, we'll get to curl. Those are the three vector operations. So if we're going to start with uh, vector multiplication, and then we'll get into uh, three different vector operations. So the reason why all these things are important, the things that we're going to cover today, is because uh, these three uh, um, types of vector multiplication form the basis for gradient divergence and curl, along with a few other concepts. And gradient divergence and curl are uh, very important in understanding vector fields, uh, especially electromagnetic fields. So, um, you know, I know for many of you, this stuff is fairly straightforward. It's just linear algebra. You've gone over it before. Uh, but just make sure that you remind yourselves how to do it so that uh, when we start talking about gradient divergence and curl and, and eventually all the concepts that arise from those, that you're, uh, you're all set. Uh, okay, so um, uh, let's uh, start by uh, just reviewing real quick. Scalar multiplication is where you, when you have a vector and you multiply it by a scalar. So let's say you had this vector a, and if you were to multiply that vector by a scalar, then the length of that vector changes by whatever you multiplied it with. So if you multiply the vector a by three, the length of the vector stays, um, the, the length of the vector changes by a factor of three, but remember that the direction does not change. The direction of the vector remains the same. The only thing that changes is the length. Okay, so that's scalar multiplication. We talked about dot products, um, the way that you calculate dot products is to multiply each of the components and then add them up. So in two dimensions, um, if you have AX and AY, and then you have BX and BY, those, these are two dimensional vectors, uh, A dot B is equal to AX times BX plus AY times BY. And in three dimensions, um, AX times BX, AY plus AY times BY plus AZ times BZ. So um, uh, all of these are just a pretty, pretty straightforward. Now, a dot product gives you a scalar. Okay, that's a, that's a key thing. Um, scalar multiplication, you notice that the result was a vector. Um, dot products, the result is a scalar. Okay, and we talked about in last class that the physical meaning of the dot product of that, that scalar is that it is the length of the projected vector. It's a component of A on the vector B. And the way that you can think about that is that um, suppose you have a vector A and a vector B, and then you draw a perpendicular line going from the, the tail of A down to B. So this will be a right, right triangle. And um, the length of this, uh, 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 the length of this vector is equal to magnitude of A times cosine of theta. The definition of the dot product is magnitude of a magnitude of b times the cosine of theta. So if b happens to have a length of 1, then, um, then the dot product is equal to the, uh, the component. Okay. If that's a little bit confusing, another way to think about it is that um, if you think about these components and projections, the component of a on b is equal to the dot product divided by the magnitude of b. So that's how we think about the physical meaning of the dot product. Um, another thing is, and I'm going to jump back here for a second, is if a and b are perpendicular, then a dot b is equal to 0. Okay. Um, remember, because the definition of a dot b is magnitude of a magnitude of b times cosine of theta. And if theta happens to be 90 degrees, so if they're perpendicular to each other, then cosine of theta is going to be equal to 0. And this whole thing is going to be equal to zero. So one useful uh, thing about the dot product is it allows you to see if two vectors are perpendicular to one another. Um, all you have to do is just take the dot product and um, see if it's equal to zero. If it's equal to zero, then they're perpendicular to one another. That's one of the most common uses of the dot product. Okay. So the component of, uh, of A on B is equal to A dot B over um, the magnitude of B. And then the projection is this entire uh, vector here. So the component is a scalar quantity. It's just the length of this red vector. And the projection is the full vector itself. So it has a magnitude and a direction. 
the magnitude of this vector is equal to the component of, uh, of a and b, and then the direction is, um, uh, is given by this equation. So the projection is equal to a dot b times a over magnitude of b squared. So these are two rules to remember if I ever ask you to calculate components and projections. Very easy way to do that. All right, we talked about an example of a projection, like why is it useful? And we gave this example of like a truck that was on a hill. So gravitational force is always pulling in the negative y direction. So that's, e that's equal to force equals ma. Um, but we're interested in looking at the force in the downhill direction because we know that if the truck is, you know, if this is a, a 90 degree slope, meaning it's like completely vertical, then you know the uh, the the uh, the downhill force on the truck is basically going to be the gravitational force, and we also know that if the if the truck is completely flat, then there's going to be no downhill force, right? Because the truck is completely flat. What we're interested in seeing is like if the if there's some kind of angle like this, and that angle is theta, what is the um, how much downhill force is would cause that truck to want to roll downwards? Because okay, so that's where something like components are useful because you take um, you take the force that you already know, the gravitational force, and you take the component of that force in a particular uh, direction. Okay, and we went over it last time, so I'm not going to bother going over the problem again today, just to remind you all. Okay, and then we ended with um, uh, a bunch of uh, examples of vector multiplication last time, so you'll have a homework problem like this, uh, so no use of going over that again. All right, um, so let's today, let's talk about the cross product. So in Cartesian coordinates, the cross product is defined uh, as, uh, as the following. Um, three dimensions is defined as the following. Now, notice that in comparison to the dot product, the cross product is a vector. Okay, and we'll talk about what the physical meaning of that vector is in just a second. But remember, dot product is a scalar, cross product is a vector. Okay. Uh, let me just check uh, to see if there is any questions. Um, okay, no questions. So I'm just going to go back here. Um, all right, so uh, in Cartesian coordinates, uh, you have these two definitions of the cross product. So you have your vector A and vector B here, and we have the shorthand notations for them. Uh, the way that it's defined is A cross B is, um, is equal to x hat, y hat, z hat on the top. It's the determinant of this matrix that you see here. So I'll explain what the determinant is in a second, but let's just look at what the structure of this is. Um, so we're defining this in terms of the uh, three-dimensional matrix, the determinant of a three-dimensional matrix. And the reason I'm doing that is so that you have the same definition for the two-dimensional and three-dimensional um, uh, matrix. Okay, so what it looks like is you construct a three by three matrix. Okay, so you have three, three rows, I'm sorry, three columns, three rows here. And in the top row, you put x hat, y hat, and z hat, the three unit vectors for the Cartesian coordinate system. Okay, and in the next row, you put your vector a. So in this case, in this two dimensional example, there's only two components, there's ax and ay. So you have your AX appearing under the X hat component, and then the AY appearing in the second column under the Y hat component. And because this is a two-dimensional vector, the, um, the Z component is zero. So uh, you just put a zero here. Um, and uh, the, the third row is, uh, um, is similar. You have your B vector, BX, BY, and then B zero here, okay? And um, the definition of cross product in two dimensions, this is what it comes out to. We'll talk about how you take this and how it becomes this thing that you see here on the third line. But it's equal to AXBY minus BXAY. So the way that you can think about it is, um, here, let me, um, uh, here we go, the laser pointer. Uh, the way that you can think about it is uh, AXBY, all right, you're crossing like this and then you subtract ay minus bx. So the reason they call it a cross product is because you go like, you draw one part of the x here, and then you draw the other part of the x. So it's ax times by minus ay minus bx. So it's, you're crossing it like that. That's why they call it the cross product. 
Um, now in three dimensions, uh, y all you do is it's the same definition. You have your three dimensional matrix, x hat, y hat, z hat on the top. Second row contains um, a, ax, ay, az, and then the third column is bx, by, bz. Now in this case, you see that the result is actually a little bit more complicated. You actually have to do three, um, three crosses, ax, by, um, ay, bz minus az, by, then you have to do a second cross like this and a, um, and a third cross like this. Um, this will all make sense in um, the next slide. Um, but just want you to note here is that when you have three dimensions like this, there's actually um, there's an x hat component, y hat component, and a z hat component. When you do the two dimension ones, notice that you only have a z hat component. And so you may be wondering, well, what is y... Um, in a two-dimensional situation, we have, um, we have an xy coordinate system. How is the result, why does the result have z hat in the, um, in the answer, right? The, it seems like the cross product is in, of a two-dimensional vectors uh, breaks out something into the third dimension. So I'll go over that when we talk about the physical meaning of the cross product. Okay, so right now we're just going over the definitions. Um, when we have a matrix like this, and we have, we, we have a matrix and we draw these two lines on the left and the right side, what that means is something called a determinant. All right. uh, this is a very common concept in linear algebra, and determinants are often used to solve systems of equations and things like eigenvalue problems. Um, and for the purposes of this class, it's going to be used to calculate the cross product. Okay. So um, let's start with the determinant of a two-dimensional matrix. Uh, so let's say you have a, a 2D matrix, A, B, C, D, and then you just put these two lines on the left and the right side. Um, so this is your, your matrix, and you use this crisscross rule to, fa uh, to figure out the determinant. All right. So the, um, the determinant of this matrix is going to be equal to AD minus BC. So again, you'll see the direction of the vector. You're going to go AD, so you're going to cross in this direction, like you're drawing an X, AD, and then you subtract out the other half of the X, minus BC. All right, so that's what you see, this crisscross uh, crisscross rule here. All right? Um, now, the determinant of a 3D matrix is, uh, is given as follows here. Um, so let's say you have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and then you have the two bars across it. Um, you are going to uh, use the crisscross rule three times. All right, the way that it works is that you're going to start with, um, uh, let's see, what's the best way to explain this? You're going to uh, take, you're going to split up a three-dimensional matrix into a series of two-dimensional matrices and find the determinant of each one of those two-dimensional matrices. And so here's how it works. Um, let me switch over here to... Let's start with uh, the first... Um, so this 3D matrix is going to end up having three different components. The first component is, so we say, okay, we're going to start with this guy here. Okay, so we're going to take the first component on the top left uh, corner and what we're going to do is we're going to cross out everything in this column and everything in this row. So we, we looked at um, this uh, first element here. We crossed out everything that was in the same column and we crossed out everything that was in the same row. So now we are left with just this box here. So we're left with a two-dimensional matrix like this. Okay, so um, now what we have to do is the first, um, the first part is we're going to take A and multiply it by the determinant of this two-dimensional matrix that you see here. Okay, so you see the A here and then you see the, the determinant of EF times HI, or EF and HI here. All right, so that's the first step. And then we do that, we do the same sort of thing for the other elements of the first column. So let me show you what I mean. So we did that for A. Now we're going to do the same thing for, uh, for B. 
So now we're going to circle our B here. And we're going to cross out everything that's in the same row as B and everything in the same column as B. All right. So now we're left with we're left with uh, this one and this one here. Okay. Um, so uh, the matrix that we're going to multiply B with is uh, D, G, and F and I. So you can see that here. And we're going to um, multiply B with the determinant of this matrix. So B times the determinant of D, F, G, I. Okay, and the same pattern is used for the third one as well. But I want you to notice a very important thing here, this negative sign. Okay, when you're finding the determinant of a three-dimensional matrix, for reasons that we're not going to talk about, uh, you, will, you have to alternate positive and negative signs. So, um, you know, the first row, uh, the first one that we did was A. And we figured out that's A times the determinant of the, um, of the matrix after removing the rows and columns that A are in. Uh, that's a positive sign. The second one is a negative sign. So that's why you put a negative sign next to the second element here. The third element is a positive sign. So it alternates between negative and positive. So if you were to do a four-dimensional matrix and so on, that's how you would... Uh, that's how you do it. But just remember for the three-dimensional matrix, we're only going to be dealing with 2D and 3D in this class. Just remember this uh, rule of determinants here, that it alternates. This one is positive. Oh boy, that's terrible. Hold on. Let me get my... Um, I'm trying to use the mouse here, so let me switch over to the pen. It's much better. All right. Yeah, so just remember that this one is positive, this one is negative, this one is positive, and you just alternate between them. Okay. So let's see, any questions? Switching over to the public chat right now to see if there are any questions. All right. Good. All right, switching back then. Uh, all right, so this is how we figured out the determinant of, um, of a three-dimensional matrix. Okay, and this is how we use the determinant to figure out the cross product. So uh, now that we've talked about determinants, now this formula should make sense to you. So the definition of, a, uh, of the cross product is that you have the x hat, y hat, z hat in the top row. And then you have the A vector in the, the second row and the B vector in the third row. And then you have the determinant of that entire matrix. So again, what we do is we take X hat, multiply by this vector, this matrix here. So that's how you get your first component. And this one has a positive sign associated with it. You do the second one with the Y hat vector. This one has a negative sign associated with it. And then you do the third one with the Z hat vector and that has the, the positive sign associated with it. Okay. All right. So um, this is how you figure out the cross product. And let's do an example right now. So um, I'm going to try to use this, uh, this polling feature and see how well it works. Um, what I'd like you to do now is try to figure out the cross product of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So your A vector is 1, 2, 3. Your B is equal to 4, 5, 6. And I would like you to try this problem on your own and choose the correct answer, A, B, C, or D. Um, and so let me bring back the formula here. This is the definition of the cross product in three dimensions. So I would like for you to all try this on your own. And for the next, like, you know, uh, you know four minutes or so, four or five minutes, um, I'm going to give you a chance to go ahead and uh, figure out what the answer is. And um, then I am going to uh, um, uh, do a poll here. And you should be able to see that poll now. 
And uh, I would like everyone, so everyone who is in the lecture right now, to put in your response after you've had a chance to figure out the problem. So uh, go ahead and take the next um, uh, three, four minutes to do that. So I'll just um, I'll just pause the conference for the next uh, three four minutes. And when you have your results, I'll be able to see the the um, responses that you put in, and then I can publish the polling results, and we can see like what the distribution was. Um, now your your result isn't going to be published to the rest of the class. It's going to be anonymized. So it's just going to show how many percentage of students showed A, how many percentage of students showed B. So. Um, just so you know. So go ahead and try that. It's, it's just a good practice to remind yourselves how to do a cross product and how to figure out um, determinants. Um, let me just make sure there are not any questions. If there's any questions, let me know. Otherwise, um, the again, the problem is you want to find the cross product of the vector 1, 2, 3 with the vector 4, 5, 6.
All right. Uh, so let's um, let's look at what we have here. Oh, we're still waiting on a few people. So I'll wait. I'll wait another uh, another minute or so for the remaining students to uh, give in their response. All right, just a little bit longer. Okay. All right, so I'll just go ahead and there's still some folks who haven't entered a response yet, but I think we'll just go ahead here. Um, so let me see if you're able to see this. So if you all click on your polling results, let's see. I don't know if you're all able to see the polling results there but it should, um, the majority of the class chose C, which is the correct answer. So that's great. 50% um, of the class chose C, so that's good. Um, all right, so any questions on that? Okay, good. Um, let's go back to the slide and just to make sure that we all know what's going on there. Uh, the solution looks like this. Um, you have your uh, vector here. The first vector is 1, 2, 3. The next vector is 4, 5, 6. All right, so you have the determinant of this matrix, which is the, the cross product. So, um, so you do x hat times the determinant of this four element matrix, 2, 3, 5, 6. Okay, and then you take the, the y hat vector and then take the determinant of the um, uh, the four element matrix one four three six right so you're just taking the elements that are uh, not part of the same row or column as y and then you do the same thing with z hat one two four five and you alternate the signs don't forget to alternate the signs the fact you have a positive sign in the x hat negative sign in the y hat portion and then a positive sign in the z hat portion okay so um, you should end up getting uh, a negative 3x hat plus 6y hat minus 3z hat. And then this is a shorthand notation that you can use. The bracket notation um, you know, just assumes that you have the x hat, y hat, and z hat components listed in the three uh, portions of whatever's in the brackets. All right, so good. Now that we've talked about um, you know, how to calculate the cross product, let's now talk about the physical meaning. Um, the physical meaning of the cross product, remember, is a vector. The cross product of two vectors is another vector uh, that is orthogonal to both A and B. And the magnitude is equal to magnitude of A, magnitude of B, sine of theta, AB. So if you remember from the right-hand rule, so you have the, imagine that you have a vector A, and then you have a vector B, okay? And then the vector a cross b is going to be um, it's going to be perpendicular uh, to both a and b. So another way to think about that is if you imagine a and b and uh, two vectors can define a plane. So def imagine the plane that's defined by this uh, uh, pinkish region here. And uh, the imagine that a cross b is going to be a vector that is perpendicular to this plane. 
All right, so whatever makes more sense to you, you can think about it as this A cross B is a vector that is perpendicular to both A and B, or you can think about it is that A cross B is perpendicular to the plane that is generated from these two vectors, A and B. Okay, so that that's the important part of the, about the direction of the cross product. So if I tell you to find the um, a vector that's perpendicular to both A and B, then the cross product is the way to do it. So the direction of the cross product tells you that, um, and the magnitude, the magnitude as it's listed here, is equal to A, the magnitude of A, magnitude of B, sine of theta um, AB. All right. So, um, you know, in a special case, if, if, the, if A and B happen to be 90 degrees apart from each other, then this sign is going to be 1. And the magnitude of A, if, if, it's, if these are also unit vectors, magnitude of A and magnitude of B are both equal to 1, then this A cross B will then uh, be equal to 1. Sometimes we use cross products in this way when we're multiplying unit vectors together. Remember, unit vectors are always orthogonal to one another, so they're always 90 degrees apart. And um, I'm sorry, unit coordinate, the unit vectors for a coordinate system are usually 90 degrees apart, and they usually have a length 1. So in that case, the, the cross products for those uh, unit vectors for the coordinate system are always, always going to be equal to 1. Um, so uh, uh, what happens if the, uh, um, if the two vectors are uh, 0 degrees apart? If you have two, if you take the cross product of two identical vectors, then the um, the angle between them is equal to zero. Sine of zero is equal to zero. So then um, uh, the cross product ends up being zero. So those are two special cases to be uh, aware of. Okay, and um, what's shown below here is a right hand rule. Uh, this is a way to help you figure out the directions of uh, of the vectors. So what you want to do is you want to take your your thumb, you know, give a thumbs up sign, and then curl your fingers around like you see here. So uh, <clears throat> your the fingers are going to curl from the a vector to the b vector. All right. Um, so it goes from a to b. Your your fingers are going are curling in the direction from a from a vector going to b vector. And then your thumb is going to point in the direction of A cross B. The right hand rule helps us like always determine the direction of the, um, the resulting vector after you get the cross product. It's used throughout physics, throughout engineering. It's a convention that we use. Okay. The reason we use that is because, you know, if you have A and B and you want to find a vector that's perpendicular to both, well, there's another vector. You know, another possible vector is the vector that points down, right? So um, the right-hand rule helps us identify which which is the correct uh, correct direction. All right. So here are some properties of the cross product: um, anti-commutative. Um, a cross B is not the same thing as B cross A. Keep remember that this is very important. You you have to just multiply it with a negative sign. So if if you remember A dot B, the dot product is equal to b dot a. Right, that's for the dot product. But for the cross product, the commutative property is not true. Okay? Um, but the distributive property holds a cross uh, b plus c is equal to a cross b plus a cross c. And then the identity vector a cross a is equal to zero. And the simple the simple way you can uh, uh, justify that is the um, a cross a. There's two ways you can cr calculate a uh, cross product that we know of, right? The first one is to do the determinants and do the matrix definition, or you can also take this other definition, a times a times sine of theta. So you're going to use that definition that we uh, uh, showed on the previous slide. So um, this theta is going to be equal to 0 because the angle between two identical vectors is equal to 0. So then this ends up being 0. So the cross product of 
uh, two uh, of uh, of the two identical vectors is equal to zero. All right. So these are the properties of the cross product, and uh, so. I updated this code just as uh, updated this slide just this morning. Actually, I'm gonna um, uh, put the updated slides on um, on our on our site. Uh, but I wanted you all to have uh, a sense of both the MATLAB code and the Python code. Um, this is where I get to go on my soapbox a little bit. I talked to some of you in the um, uh, first half of class. Actually, let me take um. I want to do a little poll here. I'm curious. Um, it's a true-false poll. Um, true if you know Python or use Python, and then false if you if you don't, if you haven't yet. All right. So if you can, if you all can see the results, it's uh, there's uh, one true and seven false. So uh, it seems like only one uh, one in individual were was uh, um, has has worked with Python before. So my soapbox on this is that um, you know lately I've been working as you know I do some work with a company that's out in Reno, and I do some computer vision work for them, and um, I also do a lot of computer vision work in my lab at Wayne State. Um, computer vision, machine learning. Um, all this stuff is um, the language and tools that people use for those is really going towards um, Python. Python is a general purpose programming language that's actually very similar to MATLAB, um, but it's freely available and um, it's open source. And there are tons of developers all around the world that use and develop the, the various types of libraries for Python that, um, that make it a very, very versatile um, programming language. And MATLAB is quite versatile as well, uh, no doubt. Um, it's used throughout the industry, and there are tons of libraries that have been developed for MATLAB that the company MathWorks has done an excellent job in, in developing over the years. But really, like um, even, even a big company such as MathWorks is no match for um, like an open source community of developers throughout the world. So nowadays, like with machine learning and data science, really Python is used uh, much more frequently than, than MATLAB. Uh, we're not doing data science in this class, but we're just doing some simple uh, linear, uh, linear algebra. And um, when I spoke to some of you after the first day of class, many of you had expressed an interest in learning uh, Python. So what I thought is, you know, we can take this boring chapter of, you know, vector math and just do a little bit of Python stuff. So you, for those of you who are interested in learning more, you can just install the, some of this stuff on your computer. Like I said, it's completely free. And, uh, you know, you can start playing, playing around with it. And so that's, that's, the, um, that's my soapbox here. Um, both Python and MATLAB will make you more valuable as engineers in industry. Uh, MATLAB is used throughout many, many large companies, including w well throughout the auto industry. MATLAB and Simulink are very frequently used. And some of you have, may have already used um, MATLAB in the, um, the work that you do at your companies. In fact, let's um, uh, yes, no. Yes, no. Say yes if you have used MATLAB at your company. The co if you work at a company, your company uses MATLAB, you can say yes. And if your company does not use MATLAB, you can say no. I'm just curious uh, where we're at with that. So right now we're at um, eight percent. Like oh, one uh, one individual has used MATLAB in oh public chat. Let's see what's going on here. Um, you can actually fill it out in the poll. Oh, Ivan says it's a company meritor. Got it. Got it. Um, just waiting for some uh, some other view, some other responses here. Just say yes or no. Yes, if your company uses MATLAB. All right. Yeah. So it seems like there's um, one company that does, and, and a lot of companies that don't. So this is interesting to see. Like uh, last time when I did a poll like this, it seemed like most of the companies were using MATLAB. So in any case, um, I will I will say MATLAB is still used like very frequently through the. Um, through the automotive industry and in the Detroit area with a lot of uh, technical companies and throughout the country. But uh, Python is becoming more and more prevalent nowadays. So 
enough of the soapbox now we can get to actual the actual code um, I'm going to demonstrate to you how to calculate vectors, dot products, and cross products in MATLAB and in Python. So how we're going to do this, let me see, I can share, um, what's the best way to do this? Um, I'm going to share uh, my screen here. I'm going to, sh yeah, I'll share my entire screen for a second here. Okay, so you all should be able to see my entire screen now. Um, the way that you uh, can use MATLAB, well, one way you can use it, you can just uh, install MATLAB on your computer. Uh, certain types of licenses, and there's actually an online version of MATLAB. So if you purchase a license, you may be able to use it online. Um, the license that I have allows me to use it online. I also have a version on my system too, but the, the online one is, is easier. So you just uh, start up MATLAB like this. Most of the times MATLAB is, um, has all the libraries loaded into it. So for many of you at the university, um, there is, you can log into the Wayne State Computer Network using the VDI tool, the virtual, uh, the virtual infrastructure that, uh, um, that you probably already know about. If you don't, then please like text me or email me and I will um, get some information and send that out to the class. But that allows you to log into any of the computers on the Wayne State campus and use tools like MATLAB. Um, so, you know, for doing something simple like this, I'll just, uh, if you look at the MATLAB code, you can just define two vectors by just putting in the magnitudes of the components of the vectors. So we just did this problem multiplying the two vectors A, one, two, three, and then B is equal to four, five, six. So the way that we do that is um, we can just do A equals 1, 2, 3, and B is equal to 4, 5, 6. You're defining your two vectors here, and you'll notice that your workspace has the two variables in there. Let's close this. And then um, with MATLAB, there are some simple commands that you can use to find out the magnitude and the cross and the dot product. So let's do the norm of A. So the norm is the magnitude of A. We talked about how to calculate the magnitude in the previous class. So it's the square root of x squared plus b squared plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Sum of squares of the components. So you can do that. So if you also do, if you if you are you could also calculate it the long way. You could say the square root of um, a zero squared. Uh, plus uh, a1 squared plus a2 squared ah, I don't quite remember how to use it. Um, Okay, so let me, let me fix up that formula. I'm used to doing Python nowadays, so that's why. So this is the long way of doing it, where you're taking the sum of squares of each of the components in A. So A is equal to one, two, three. So A um, with the parentheses one takes the first component of A, and A parentheses two takes the second component of A, and so on. Okay, so this is the long way to calculate it, and um, and also do the norm of a like that and get the same answer. All right. So the next one is you want. Let's say we want to find the unit vector. So you can just do a divided by the norm of a, and there's your unit vector. You can set that equal to a variable. Let's say let's say we'll call this unit vector u. And now now our result is saved in u. Um, we can also do the cross product and dot product. So let's say we do uh, cross product, cross A and B. That calculates the cross product, and we can also do the dot product of A and B, like that. All right, um, I'm going to check now and see if we have any questions.
Okay. No questions. All right, good. Okay, next thing I want to show is um, how do we do this in Python? So for those of you who have not used Python before, um, and if you have like a few hours at any point, like I highly recommend you just uh, do this. You, you can go to a website called Anaconda. So I imagine most of you are, um, are using, uh, um, hold on, let's just do download Anaconda. Well, many of you are probably using Windows. So you can go here and um, uh, download Anaconda. It's it's a it's an easy way to install Python on your system. So you know they're calling this Anaconda the world's most popular data science platform. What it is is ba it's just basically a, an easy way to install Python and maintain all the packages that are in in Python. Like it'll do like updates. You can update all your code. You can update all the Python packages and so forth. So it's just a, a, an easy way to do that. You could actually download Python directly from Python's website and work directly with that. But most of the time, they just most people just recommend if you're using Windows, especially, just use um, Anaconda. So I'll show you what that looks like. You know, you you're going to download this, and um, in Anaconda, you can um, it has all these different tools built into it. So you just do a single download, and then you get all this stuff. Um, it also downloads a lot of like uh, Python libraries and things like that. So you're, you're gonna you would download it, and of course I've already downloaded and installed it. And um, I'll just go here Anaconda since I've already installed it. Once you install it, you'll see something like this. Um, give me just a second here. And remember, all this stuff is free, so it's uh, very easy for you all to have. Uh, you don't have to pay the hundred dollars or so that you need for that MATLAB license, which is already. Um, it's always annoyed me, to be frank. So let's give this a second to load up. All right. Yeah, when you get into Anaconda Navigator, then um, you'll see something like this, and um, you'll see all the tools that you can launch directly from here. There's something called Jupyter Lab. There's something called Jupyter Notebook. This is what we're going to use. Um, IPython console, and then Spider, and uh, VS Code and GlueViz. We are going to be using Jupyter Notebook today, but you can do the same thing in IPython. Okay. So if you if we were to launch this, for example, it'll just open up a little window here. Let's give it a second. And you see, this is very similar to the MATLAB window. So you can just um, uh, you can just enter things like a equals one, two, three. The, you see the syntax is a little bit different than MATLAB, but it's very, you know, very, very similar. And you can show B there. So it's just a command line interface there. Um, now, for uh, this command line interface is not really great for making graphics. As you know, like plotting stuff is a very important part of doing any kind of data analysis. So this one's good for doing, um, uh, what, do you, what do you say, like uh, just um, you know, numerical calculations. And I'll show you another interface that's good for doing, um, uh, for doing graphics. And that's to, that thing is called Jupyter Notebook. But let me just give you a quick walk around here since we're already in Anaconda Navigator. You can go here and in your environments, um, you'll see that it, there'll be a base default environment installed here. And this is one of the cool things about um, uh, Python is that you can, um, you know, what I'm going to do is click here and see like all the different packages that are installed. So Python is, uh, uh, the, the libraries for Python are maintained by developers all around the world. And there's libraries to do almost anything you can imagine. There's like web development libraries, there's data science libraries, there's computer vision libraries, there's graphics libraries, data compression, any, anything you can imagine, there's a library for. So Anaconda actually comes with a lot of these libraries built in. Um, and so, you, you know, for most of the stuff that you're going to do in, in this class, for example, you wouldn't need any, um, any to install anything else. But you can, um, you can search the website for um, libraries that you haven't installed yet. And, um, you know, you can select, if you just want to install a particular library, you just click on this 
and then you, you go to apply in the bottom left corner, bottom right corner, and then you can install it. Um, and then, so this way, it, it just becomes a very easy way for you to install stuff. Okay, so uh, we're going to use Jupyter Notebook, and you would just click on this launch button, but I've actually already started it up. And what Jupyter Notebook is, is um, when you start it up, you'll see a little window like this. And what it does, it actually starts up a little web server on your own computer. All right, so your, your own computer becomes a Jupyter web server, and then you can go to just a web browser. You go to a web browser like this, and you can actually have, you know, you can do all your calculations in your web browser. So the nice thing about this is that um, you could you could create a, um, you know, companies sometimes do this, that they have a Jupyter server uh, on, on, a, on a server somewhere, and you can just log in and do all your calculations. And that server may be like a very powerful server with many CPUs, and you can just, it becomes an easy way to access it that way. But right now what we're doing is we're starting a Jupyter notebook on our, on our own computer. So I'm starting it on my own computer, and I'm just showing you here how to do some simple calculations here. When you start up Jupyter Notebook, you'll see something like this, where you'll be in a certain directory, and you can create um, a new notebook by just going under New and click Python 3 here. And then you'll see something like this. And I've already filled out um, this notebook uh, earlier, just to save some time. Um, I'm just going to walk you through it. One important difference between MATLAB and Jupyter Notebook is that um, you, uh, um, in Python and Jupyter Notebook, you actually have to import the libraries that you plan to use. So if you compare this to MATLAB, um, you remember what we did here? We just we just started typing in this, uh, the commands and uh, the norm and the cross product. It's already built into a particular MATLAB uh, installation. It's already installed. Um, in the case of the Jupyter Notebook, um, it's installed on your system, but in order to use it in, um, in a particular uh, calculation, you have to import the library first. So import NumPy as NP. Um, num NumPy or NumPy, it, it's, um, it's a, a library that's used for uh, doing um, numerical calculations. It's probably one of the most um, often used libraries in Python. So we're just importing this um, NumPy library as uh, NP. That's just an abbreviation um, so that we don't have to type NumPy every time we want to access this library. It just, this is an abbreviation for it. So the first thing we're doing here is we are creating the two... Um, uh, the two vectors a equal to one two three b equals four five six um, and you press shift enter so so that does that calculation if you actually want to print them out you could just have you just do a on a, on a line on its own and it'll print out the result there you can also do something like print a that will also do the same thing so if i want to print a and print b so you can do that um, and so you can actually have several lines of code in each one of these gray boxes. You could have one line like we do here. You can have multiple lines. These little gray boxes are called cells. A cell contains one line of code or multiple lines of code. And when you run that cell, it just executes that, that line, those lines of code, and, and it shows the result here. And you can do graphics here too. I'll show that to you some other time. Um, so the way that you calculate the, the magnitude of a vector in MATLAB, we used um, sorry. In MATLAB, we used the um, the norm command. All right. In Python, we use um, NP. Remember, NP stands for NumPy. In the NumPy library, there's a um, there's a section called lin algebra, which stands for linear algebra, and then we do dot norm. Okay. And we're setting that equal to the mag of a. The magnitude of a is equal to um, np.linalgebra.norm, and then we're going to print out the value of um, of this. So you can see the error that happened here. I forgot to import the library. I didn't execute this statement here. So I'm just going to go here and press Shift Enter to execute this. And now we've imported the library, and now you'll see that this one will work. All right. So the magnitude of a is equal to 3.7. Same answer that we got in the MATLAB. And um, the, we calculate the magnitude of B here. And um, here we can do the unit vector of A is, is, the, um, is A divided by its magnitude. And you can see the result come up here. Um, as I said before, you can also just do a print command like this if you want to print the value of the variable. And you'll see it come up in a slightly different format. 
If you want to do the cross product, then you just do NP for the NumPy library, the dot, which means I'm going to access a member of the, of the NumPy library, and then you can do the cross function. So by the way, if you go, if you just, um, if you go to uh, uh, the web and you just go to NumPy, you will see the full documentation for this. Um, and, uh, you know, this has all the, uh, uh, all the functions. So NumPy user guide, NumPy reference, and the reference has all the functions that are available in, um, in NumPy. And, um, you know, like you can actually do, the, the, the nice thing is that there's so many people using Python, you can just do a Google search like um, how um, cross product Python, something like that. And most of the time, uh, part of the NumPy manual will show up, and it'll show you exactly how to do um, how to do that. All right, so it'll even give you nice examples like this, like we showed here. Um, it's just really, really nice. Uh, there's a huge community of people that maintain all this stuff, and it's usually up to date. And there's some very sophisticated functions that are available that you can use. All right, so um, that's what I normally do when I'm doing um, any kind of uh, work using Jupyter Notebook or Python. I do a lot of Google searches just like everyone else does, and um, you, it'll t point you to the right portion of the library, and then you can, you can read all the details on it. So this is saying that this is the function called cross. It takes in as an input A and B, the two vectors, and then it has all these other um, special options, optional things that you can also specify, and it, everything's like quite detailed. What does it return, and so forth. Um, all right, good. So now we've uh, briefly shown how to do uh, uh, cross product and dot product. Just a little bit of an error here. Um, I want to fix that little error up. Give it just a second. When I, whenever I shut down power, the slideshow, it, it, there's a little bit of a delay. Uh, yeah, I just had a little bit of a mistake here. This should be np dot. All right, and these these are the commands that you can use. So I, I highly recommend that you you download um, Anaconda and just try this out. If you have a MATLAB on your system, try this out. Um, if you have MATLAB online, you can you can go to um, you can go to MATLAB online and see if the license that you have will support. Um, just using the web browser with MATLAB. Otherwise, you can use VDI to log into the Wayne State system and use it that way. Okay, now I'm going to go back and see if there are any questions. Um, uh, if you have any questions, please just go ahead and put them in the public chat. Okay. All right. Okay, good. So now you've had your first exposure to uh, Jupyter Notebook and Python, how to do some simple calculations, and uh, we will move on now. Uh, okay, I will go to vector math. Um, okay, I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint window now, PowerPoint slideshow, and you should be able to see my PowerPoint window now in full screen. Okay, so now we're going to talk about equations of planes. So uh, planes are going to be important in some of the stuff that we do in electromagnetics that are related to um, related to how uh, vectors, how light waves will bend at an interface, reflection, refraction, and stuff like that. So we want to remind ourselves how about the equations of planes. So this is the basic equation for a plane. There's actually a few different versions that you can use. Um, the first one is n dot pq is equal to zero. And the way that you can think about this is that imagine you have some plane that's defined with in blue. Okay, And if you want to define a plane, then uh, um, what you want to do is have a vector that's perpendicular to that plane. So what you can do is, is find a vector that resides on the plane, like PQ. And remember how we said that um, the easiest way to find out if two vectors are perpendicular or not is to take the dot product. 
if, if the dot product between two vectors is zero, that means that uh, the two vectors are perpendicular to each other. Okay, so imagine that we have a vector um, on the plane, and the way that you get a vector on the plane is that you start off with two points that are on the plane. Let's say you have this point here, this gray dot, another gray dot, so two points on the plane, and you draw a line between them and draw a vector between them, uh, and so that's where this, uh, imagine that you have a point x0, y0, and z0, x, y, and z. Um, so that's how uh, you get this vector pq. The difference between q and p is this vector pq. So you can see that here where we have x minus x0, y minus y0, z minus uh, z0. Okay, and then we multiply that with an, a normal vector n hat. And remember, if these two vectors, if, if n hat is actually uh, perpendicular to the plane, then these two vectors will be, uh, um, the cross product of them, sorry, the dot product between them will be equal to zero. So that's where this equation comes from. The normal vector to the plane crossed, uh, dotted with a vector on the plane is equal to zero. And we expand that out so n, remember, has three components in it, the x component, y component, and z component, so x hat, y hat, z hat. And then you have this vector pq that we've expanded by saying x minus x0, y minus y0, z minus z0. Okay, it looks like there's some noise in the background. Um, all right, can you all still hear my voice? Um, just say, just put in yes on the public chat if you... Um, if you're able to still hear my voice. It seems like they're testing some kind of alarm system here, so I apologize, this might be a little irritating. All right, good. So we will continue then. Um, so um, uh, that's where we come up with the second line here. We just expanded out the PQ, and then um, this last line here, we just um, d uh, we moved all the X terms to one side the x, y, and z terms to one side, and the x naught, y naught, z naught terms to the other side. So these are all the three, all originating from this basic equation, n dot pq is equal to zero. All right, so um, a typical example would be something like this. Find the equation of a plane that's perpendicular to the vector 2, 1, 3, and um, the plane also contains the point 4, 5, uh, 4, 5, 0. And so here is the uh, solution. Um, the, uh, uh, the solution looks like this. So the typical problem that you would, you would get is like finding a plane perpendicular to a particular vector. And the plane also contains a certain point. Because I want you to think about this. If you have, um, let me go back to this previous slide here. If you just have a vector in space, um, you know, you can find a plane that's perpendicular to it. This plane is perpendicular to this vector, right? But guess what? This plane here is also perpendicular to this vector, right? They're both perpendicular to the vector. So which plane, you know, how do we uniquely identify a plane? Well, there's, there's a couple ways to identify a plane. One is what you see here. A plane is identified by a point and a normal vector. This is one way to identify a plane. Another way to identify a plane is by three points. Okay, two points is enough to define a line. Three points is enough to define a plane. All right, so we are more focused on this approach here where we define a plane by a point and a normal vector. So getting back to this example then, if um, you know, um, just a normal vector on its own is not enough to define a plane, but if we also say um, there's a certain point that the plane contains, now we have um, uh, now we have a, a, a specific definition. And the point doesn't have to be like right here. It could be any any point on the plane, would, uh, along with the normal vector, would define that plane. Okay, uh, let me check for any questions. Okay, no questions there. So here's a solution. 
um, you just use this uh, plane equation, n dot pq is equal to zero. Um, you expand that out just like we did on the previous slide. X minus x hat, y minus y, uh, x minus x naught, y minus y naught, z minus z naught, multiplied by the unit vector is equal to uh, zero. Um, now what we do here is we enter our point information, the four, five, and zero, and we also enter our normal vector uh, equation, two, one, three. So the x component is two, the y component is one, the z component is three, um, and then the, uh, uh, um, the x naught, y naught, z naught, four, five, and zero are also uh, entered here. So x minus four, the x component, y minus five, the y component, and then z minus zero here. All right, and you solve for that equation, and here's your equation for the plane, no problem. 2x plus 3y, 2x plus y plus 3z is equal to uh, 13. Now I want you to see an important feature here. An important feature here is that when you get to this equation here, the x comp um, you'll, you can put a plane in what's, this is one form of a plane equation, okay? So um, you'll have an x, something times x, something times y, and something, something times z. And what do you notice here? You got your two, you have a one here, and then you have a three. That is exactly the same as your perpendicular vector. All right, so if I give you a plane equation, um, you should be able to tell me the normal vector, no problem, and vice versa. Okay, this last part here, this constant here, it, it helps identify what, um, uh, which one of the planes it is. And by, by in indicating a point on the plane, you can ultimately figure out what this constant is. All right, so in other words, like the first three, the, the x and the y and the z component tell you the normal vector. And then that, that term on the right-hand side tells you which one of these planes it is. Is it this plane or is it this plane? All right. So um, example, just to make sure we're all listening, um, find the vector that's perpendicular to the plane defined by 2x plus 3y minus 5z is equal to 1. So just choose one of these four. And I will... Um, and we'll just do a quick pull here. So I'll just wait, wait another, you know, wait another half a minute or so. Don't be shy. This is not graded, so just uh, go ahead and put in your answer. I won't hold it against you. <laughs> this is just a way for me to see uh, where we're at as, in terms of is, ev is everyone understanding you know, if there's stuff that we need to go over. All right, we have seven out of 12 people responding. I think we need a few more. I'd like to wait for a few more. All right, okay, looks like we got, got a couple here. So um, looks like 50% uh, fifty percent of the students put C, which is the correct answer. 17% uh, put B, and uh, A and C, no one, no one selected those. 
All right, so C is the correct answer. Um, let's go back to this. And the, the way that we want to solve this problem is, is just uh, what I said at the end of the last slide, is this, is, uh, this equation is in a standard plane equation form. All right, and these three, these three numbers indicate the, uh, the vector that is perpendicular to the plane. All right, so the vector perpendicular to the plane will be 2 times x hat plus 3 times y hat minus 5 times z hat. So we're basically just reading it right from the equation. Right? If we want to find a point that's on the plane, then we just have to do, we have to solve this equation for, um, you know, uh, so this is the, uh, um, this is the perpendicular vector. And if we want to find a point on the plane, this is uh, fairly straightforward also. Then we just uh, pick a value for x, pick a value for y, and then we can um, solve for z. All right, so let's say we pick x equals 0, y equals, y equals 0, just to make things easy. Then we have 2 times 0 plus 3 times 0 minus 5 times z is equal to 1. We have negative 5z equals 1. And we have z is equal to negative 1 fifth. Negative 1 fifth. Okay. So from, uh, from your equation of a plane, you can figure out a perpendicular vector. You can figure out one point on a plane, you could figure out 10 points on a plane if you want. Um, and the most important thing is figuring out the, the uh, orthogonal vector here. And you can just read that directly off the equation. Okay, good. So let's move on then. I just have the solution here as well. Uh, let me go to the window to see if there are any questions. No questions. Good. All right, continuing on, uh, there is something called the triple product. We talked about dot products and we talked about cross products. And triple products are a combination of both. And here's a couple examples here. So when we multiply three vectors together using the scalar, dot, or cross product multiplication, we have something called the triple product. And the result of a triple product can be either vector or scalar depending on which triple product it is. So here's the two triple products. Um, so a triple product is when we have three vectors, A, B, and C. The scalar product is defined as A dot dotted with B cross C. And if you remember, you recall, like B cross C, the cross product is a vector. And then A is a vector. So the dot, of, um, the dot of two vectors is equal to a scalar. So that's why this is called the scalar triple product. All right, and the, there's some uh, uh, commutative properties here that you can look at. So this is also equal to b dot c cross a, and this is also equal to c dot a cross b. All right, so just, um, you know, we're not gonna go into the derivations of all those, just remember those. Uh, the second type of triple product is where we have a cross product here. So this is a vector. And then you're multiplying this with, where you're crossing this with another vector. Right, so the result is a vector. All right, so the vector triple product is defined as this, a cross parentheses b cross c. And um, there's a distributive property here where you can convert these cross products into dot products to make them easier to calculate. 
Um, so it becomes a combination of scalar multiplication and dot product multiplication. And if you want to memorize this, the, the way to memorize this is to, to say back minus cab. It's just a, just a goofy phrase that you can use to remember it. So b uh, um, vector multiplied by uh, scalar here. Remember the dot product here is a scalar. So this is going to be a scalar. This is going to be a scalar. And this is also a scalar. So you have scalar multiplied by scalar. It's just a, an easier way to calculate this vector uh, triple product here. And remember, you can use, um, if, if you're just doing these calculations for an assignment, you can use MATLAB to check your answer. Obviously, if you're in a test, you can't do that. But um, yeah, these calculations are, can go rel relatively quick. So in this class, we like to focus on like what the physical meaning is. If it was a math class, we'd focus on derivations. But in an engineering class, we want to say, like, how do we use these things? You know, how do we use a triple product? Where do we use it? Um, so the physical meaning of the triple product is it's, uh, it's equal to the volume of the parallel pipette, which is a three-dimensional version of a parallelogram defined by A, B, and C. So suppose we have our vectors here. We have A, B, and C. So put those three vectors next to each other. So the head of the three vectors are all um, at the same point. So all the head, the head of all three vectors are all at the same point. The A, B, and C are all pointing out. And when you set up the vectors in that way, imagine that there's um, a three-dimensional parallelogram that is formed uh, when, um, when you take each one of the vectors and you span them out into a cube like this. All right, so the B vector goes out like this, the A vector goes out like that. So you can draw a parallelogram between A and B. You can also draw a parallelogram between A and C. And then you can also draw a parallelogram between B and C at the bottom. All right, so that gives you three faces of a cube. And then you can, um, you can uh, um, create that three-dimensional object and, and have the, the other three faces, and then you have a volume. So the scalar triple product is going to be equal to the volume of this shape that's defined by A, B, and C. All right, and the vector triple product, vector perpendicular to A, and it lies in the plane spanned by B and C. So that's the definition, that's the physical meaning of the vector triple product. So, um, you know, the, w the way to think about this here is uh, you have, imagine that you have two vectors, B and C, all right, draw those two vectors out and then draw a plane that, that, uh, in which, that both B and C both lie in that plane. So, um, so this is the plane shown in gray here. B and C are both part of that plane. And um, A cross B cross C is um, a vector that is perpendicular to A and it's also, um, I'm sorry, A cross B cross C is a, is a vector that's perpendicular to the plane that's spanned by um, uh, uh, B and C. All right? Okay, so those are the definitions of the triple product. Let me see if there's any questions. All right, good. No questions yet. All right, so we got about like 10 or 15 minutes left, and we'll, um, we're going to cover some, get into some of the vector operations. So now we're switching gears. Now we're done with the basic definitions of uh, the cross product, the uh, dot product, and scalar multiplication. Now we're going to look at uh, vector operations. So there's four different uh, vector operators and vector fields. Um, and uh, some of them apply to scalar fields. So there's four operators here. And these four operators are important because the fields that we talk about, electrostatic fields, magnetic fields, um, there's a lot of intuition you can gain by understanding what the gradient of the field is, the divergence of the field is, curl of the field is, and so on. One of the things that we, we did talk about um, when we talked about the divergence of a field is we said it, it measures the outward flux or tendency of a point to move away from a point in the vector field. In other words, the way to think about divergence is how much does 
the, um, do the vectors point away from a certain point in space. We're going to go e over each, each one of these four in, in detail. So for right now, just let's look at the major differences between them. Uh, the gradient is, um, the mathematical notation is del, uh, del V. We'll talk about what del is. It's a vector quantity. And the physical meaning of the gradient is that the gradient vector po always points in the direction of maximum slope. For, so this applies to um, a scalar field. Uh, divergence is denoted del dot A, and it's a scalar quantity. It measures outward flux. How much are the, um, how, it applies to a vector field. How much are the, um, are the vectors pointed away from a certain point? The third one is the curl or del cross A, it's a vector quantity, it measures the recirculation or tendency of the particle to rotate at a certain point in the field. So how much, in other words, how much does this field rotate? That's um, the curl is a measure of that. And the Laplacian is, is, a, is a scalar quantity that's a measure of the gradient of the divergence of A. So how quickly is the divergence changing as we move in a certain direction? That's what the Laplacian is. So let's go over each one of these in, in detail right now, but, and let's start with the del operator. We're obviously not going to get through all of these today, um, but we're just going to get started. We'll come back to it um, the next lecture. So um, uh, let's talk about the del operator. Um, we're defining a gradient divergence and curl. There's you know, if you notice in this chart here, there's uh, um, the del shows up in, in all of these here. So what is that del? It's, it's an operator for defining gradient divergence and curl. Um, and you can think about the del operator as a three-dimensional uh, derivative. You know how we, ha we have this notation, you know, if you have a function f of x, Right, f of x uh, equals to, let's say, 3x. Let's keep it simple. All right, and we had this notation, which, which was the derivative notation. So we say d dx of f of x. All right, and we, you know, the derivative of this function is just 3. Right, so that was one notation that we use. We sometimes use this notation df dx you know, the derivative of that function is equal to 3. There's a lot of different notations that are uh, often used. But this, you know, the key thing here is we had this thing called d dx, right? And that d dx was an operator that's used in calculus to say, hey, we're going to take a derivative, derivative of this function, right? So what happens when, you're, uh, when your function is uh, not, not a scalar function, but it's a vector function? Turns out you can take derivatives of, you know, or what we think about as derivatives of vector functions, um, it, you know, using an operator similar called the del operator. It's just a more general version. It's a more general version of this basic one-dimensional um, derivative operator that, that you guys have learned a long, t um, you know, quite some time back. So the del is, is a vector that has three components. The x component is d dx, the y component is d dy, and the z component is d dz. So this is the shorthand for it, and if you write out the different components, x hat, y hat, z hat, then this is what you see. All right, so instead of just a basic d dx of a one-dimensional function, now you have a d dx, d dy, d dz. These are all like partial derivatives. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the first of the four I'm going to talk about is the gradient. The gradient is a vector quantity, um, and it, it's the you take the del operator and apply it to a scalar um, a scalar field, not a vector field, a scalar field, and um, when you apply the del operator to it, you get a vector, and the physical meaning we'll talk about that in a second, but it points in the direction of maximum slope. So we we'll first define what the gradient is. Um, how do we solve for it? On the gradient operator, when it's applied on a scalar field, this is what it looks like. Del V is equal to dV dx times x hat plus dV dy times y hat and dV dz times z hat. So these are partial derivatives. So each one of these guys, dV dx, dV dy, dV dz, 
are all partial derivatives. Okay, we'll talk about what that means. They're partial derivatives with respect to x. dv dx is partial derivative with respect to x. dv dy is a derivative of v with respect to y. dv dz is a derivative of v with respect to z. All right. This is the definition in Cartesian coordinates. And uh, you can look later. Uh, we'll, we'll have a table that has a definition of the gradient in spherical and cylindrical coordinates once we get to those uh, coordinate systems. So here's a physical meaning of the gradient. So we imagine that we have a two-dimensional scalar field, f of x, y. And um, when we plot it, this appears as a surface. So what you see on the top here is a plot of a two-dimensional scalar field. So just for, um, I guess, uh, just for some kind of physical intuition, let's say, uh, let's say this f of x, y is, um, is the elevation, right? Let's say this is a contour map, like a, a map of you're going hiking in the mountains. Let's just say elevation. Okay. So uh, the reason I chose elevation is because, you know, th th that's what this graph is essentially showing. Like, you know, it's uh, this function is showing you it has it's a 2D field, meaning at every, at every point X and Y, it defines a value. So, you know, at X equals 0, Y equals 0, the value of the function is equal to, you can see it's negative 4 here. But out here, let, let's say uh, X is equal to ne negative um negative 45 and y is equal to negative 45 somewhere here um, the function is close to zero um, so uh, a two-dimensional scalar field means you, you have f of x and y and if we say that it's an elevation then you know when you plot it out like this you can uh, you can see a, a graph like this that that shows um, that visualizes that scalar function and if you imagine this as an elevation imagine that you were on a mountain, right? You are hiking out in the mountains, and um, this defines what the what the elevation is. So here you have like you're in a kind of a basin between the mountains, and here is like the highest elevation, so maybe near the top of a mountain, and so on. Here's like a little ridge line here. Um, so uh, the reason I bring up the elevation thing is because it, it becomes more intuition when you think about what the gradient physically means. So the gradient of this uh, 2D scalar field is going to be a 2D vector field, gradient of f. And um, that is going to define what the slope is at any given point and what direction we should go to go in the maximum slope. So let's do one at a time here. The direction of the gradient vector points in the direction of the steepest slope. So if this was an elevation uh, function, then, and if this was, like, let's say I was standing right here where my mouse is, and I'll mark it with, I'll mark it with a pen here. Let's say I was standing right here, okay? And um, my question to you is, what is the gradient at that point in space? The gradient, the direction of the gradient vector points in the direction that you should walk in for the maximum increase in um, maximum slope so let's talk about what that means. If we walk, if we walked in this direction, if we go in the downward direction, that's going to be a negative slope. So that's a, that's a negative value. If we go in this direction, that's going to be a zero slope because if we walk horizontally like that, then our elevation isn't really changing, right? We're not going to a higher point on the mountain. We're staying at the same elevation on the mountain. But if you go in this direction, if you go in this direction, you are going to get the maximum elevation gain. In other words, if you walk in that direction, there would be the steepest slope. You'd have the steepest slope on the mountain. Okay, so the, the direction of the gradient vector tells you what direction will have the steepest slope if I walk in that direction. All right, and the magnitude of the gradient is the slope of the steepest incline, meaning if I did walk in this direction, if I did walk in this uh, the direction of steepest slope, 
what is that slope actually going to be? You know, like is is yeah, uh, you know, slope as as you know, it's it's uh, uh, dz dx. So it would be like, um, how much elevation gain for every step that I walk in this direction? How much elevation gain am I going to have? It's the slope of the function in a specific direction. All right, let me back here and see if there are any questions. Any questions? Okay. So we'll, we can end with this. You know, suppose we have a 3D function f of x, y, z, which gives a temperature at every point in a three-dimensional space. What is the physical meaning of the gradient of f? So let's see if, if anyone can just type in a response here in the public chat. Um, a three-dimensional function f of x, y, z, it gives the temperature at every point in a three-dimensional space. What would the gradient function, what would the gradient of this function tell us? Okay. Any responses here? Let's see, Arad is typing something. Okay, so Arad says the vector pointed towards where the next higher temperature be, would be next to that point. Yeah, exactly. It's very, very close. It, it, is, um, it would point in the direction that we would want to walk, the direction we'd want to go to get the maximum increase in temperature. So it's correct. Um, so the second question is, suppose I'm standing on the side of a triangular cone. This is just another version of we did here. Imagine that we have a cone like this. Suppose I'm standing here. We're, we're on, a, on a, a mountain that looks like a perfect cone. Suppose I'm standing on the side of a triangular cone. Which way does a gradient vector point? So I'm going to answer this question. The gradient vector is going to point in this direction. It's going to point towards the center of the cone because this is the direction we would want to walk to get the maximum increase in, in slope. So um, this is the direction we would want to go. And the actual slope would be um, the actual slope would be given by the rise over the run. The elevation gain that we would get by walking in this direction over the, the number of steps we walk. So if this was y and this was x, the magnitude of the gradient would be equal to y over x. Okay. I think we may need to come back to this at the in the next class so it's more clear. But um, basically, like which way does the gradient vector point? It points in the direction of x that you see here. This is the direction that you would want to walk to get the maximum increase in, in elevation. And the actual increase in elevation, the slope, if you walked in that direction, would be y over x. All right. And then one little uh, uh, question here that I want, want you to think about this. We won't just answer it right now. Um, suppose I'm on the tip of the cone, which way does a gradient vector point? So I'll let you think about that um, um, between now and the next class. All right, um, so we are getting, uh, we're at 11.10 right now. So we're, we're going to stop here for today. Uh, the lecture uh, recording will be posted online. Um, I will be posting a homework that's going to be due um, next week. And... Uh, Regarding Wednesday's class, there's a, a little bit of a, I have a meeting issue on Wednesday morning. So there is, um, there's a chance we'll just have lecture as planned. There's a chance we might end a little bit early. Or in the worst case, um, I will send you all an email and um, have you all just do some questions, um, some questions through Canvas uh, in lieu of, uh, of the lecture.
Okay, some practice questions. So I'll keep you posted on that. You know, expect an email before Wednesday morning, obviously, about that. And um, also, there will be some uh, a homework assignment that's posted. So um, keep out on the notices for, for that. Um, any final questions today before we stop the class? Arad has a question. Yeah, Arad, so the, will Wednesdays, uh, Wednesday be in class or online? Um, I'm still out of town, so Wednesday will be, uh, uh, it will be online. The question is whether we will have, either we'll have like some kind of pre-recorded thing, um, I might, or, or we'll have the regular class online uh, at the normal time. Um, and in the worst case, if my meeting conflict can't be managed, then um, I will give you all some, uh, some problems to do through Canvas that you can do online uh, in lieu of lecture. So it, it won't be in class, short answer. Um, the the uh, regular classes will start again uh, starting on Monday because I'll be back in town Wednesday night. Okay, great. So um, let's stop here. Thanks for your attention, everyone. And I will um, see you all, talk to you all uh, on Wednesday. The lecture will be posted very soon, so just so you all know. Thank you.